Eyewitness News presents Newsmakers with your hosts, Jane Ann Bugda and Andy Mahalshek. Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda. And I'm Andy Mahalshek. The Institute of Public Policy and Economic Development tracks economic and social trends across our region and provides solutions to help our region grow. Now the team is taking a closer look at the pandemic's impact on jobs, the economy, and what to expect in the future. We'll find out what they learned when this edition of Newsmakers returns right after this. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugged along with Andy Mahalshik. A little over a year ago, we had the Institute on to talk about, you know, jobs in the area trends, see what was going on, and the outlook was very good. And then the pandemic the virus and things changed. And whoever would have thought 2020 would have been like it was last year, a year that many people quite frankly are glad to see out of here, but today a very special program with a very special group uh, in, in the area. Right, we are joined by Terry Ohms, who's with the, um, who's the executive director of the Institute of Public Policy and Economic Development. We'll be calling it the Institute throughout the show. And Terry, thank you for joining us. We, uh, we were talking, you were here over a little uh, year ago and the outlook was good. And uh, so today uh, you did new studies, maybe offer some hope for people out there looking for jobs and, and, a, and a, a good outlook on the area. But first, you know, to give our viewers a little bit of better understanding, explain what the Institute is and what you do. Sure, Th thank you both. It really is a pleasure to be here and to share information about our organization and our research. Um, the Institute is a, a research organization that focuses on applied research and social innovation. Uh, we're a unique partnership of higher education, the 13 major institutions in the region and the business community. And we were formed back in 2004 to put data, analytics, interpretation, best practices and recommendations to regional problems and even opportunities out in the community so that individuals in all sectors could make more informed decisions. How unique, are there any other groups like the Institute in the Commonwealth uh, or, the, or the nation that you're aware of? Uh, yes and no. Um, there are organizations, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Brookings Institute, which is also our, our research organizations. Um, organizations like ours are primarily in the major metropolitan areas. So there are several in Philly and Pittsburgh affiliated with schools like UPenn and University of Pittsburgh, uh, NYU, out in, at USC, UCLA, Berkeley, and, and other schools around the country. But um, we are the only type of our organization um, in northeastern Pennsylvania, um, and uh, it's, it's very unusual to have this kind of organization in a, a smaller region, um, but with the foresight of, of the presidents of our higher education institutions and their collaborative work with the business community, we were formed um, to do just that for northeastern Pennsylvania. So you have you give a unique look at the area. You study the trends and what's going on, but how has you know the pandemic? It has touched all of our lives. I mean, normally you'd be here with us. We're still doing Zoom interviews. We're still social distancing. How has it impacted your work at the institute? Well, it has been an interesting year. Uh, we, as a, a team, started working from home last March. And, and frankly, that transition for our group was very easy. Um, we were mobile to begin with. Um, we all had laptops and worked out in the field and had the electronic systems in place to do our work. Um, so that component was, was fairly easy. Uh, however, collecting data, primary data in the community was a bit of a challenge. Obviously, we couldn't hold focus groups or, or sit down and have interviews with people on a face-to-face -face basis. So we had to move everything to online venues. So um, we will conduct small group focus groups using Zoom or some other platform. Uh, we've, we used to conduct our surveys electronically anyway, but now we've added texting components to make it a little bit even easier. Um, and then uh, old fashioned phone interviews or FaceTime or even uh, digital means like this are the way we, ways we conduct individual interviews. Um, and, and we've bounced our, our methodology uh, with other research organizations across the country and they're doing the same thing. 
Um, it's the only way that we could get real time information and be able to find out exactly what's going on in our community. Normally with federal and state data, now's going to be no difference. There's an 18 to 24 month lag in the data. So if you want to know what's happening now, you have to be in a position to collect it yourselves. And really, Terry, you know, you're talking about what's happening now. You're talking about the, the, the normal flow of data, what's 14 to 18 months, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a real time. Explain a little bit of, you have, did an extensive report on the COVID-19 impact, the pandemic on our region. Very extensive report. We'll have it on our website, uh, link it to your website. What were some of the, of many findings, how did you do that, that survey first of all? And what stood out in that report, COVID-19? Explain what impact and what factors you looked at and what you found. Again, thumbnail sketch. Sure. Uh, back in April, we realized that um, this is going to have serious implications that could reverse positive economic trends, um, affect us for a very long time. So we developed a very detailed research agenda that we were calling the Institute Insights on COVID-19. We had some very generous research sponsors to help support it. So we've done nearly a dozen different types of studies looking at different aspects of our community. So K through 12, business and industry, social services, local government, healthcare, um, to be able to study what's happening now. And um, we're gonna start a phase two, if you will, uh, in this probably late February, early March, to find out what's changed since we started. Um, I'm not sure there are a lot of surprises. Um, there certainly was both positive and negative disruption on the business side uh, immediately with the shutdown that occurred in uh, late March, early April. But as the economy started opening up, we started seeing some, some changes and some improvement. Um, and certainly there, there were more, uh, there was some positive disruption as a result of people changing the way they were living and what their priorities were. And then there's negative disruption. So the small businesses in our downtowns that lost the foot traffic and the restaurants and um, theaters and, and other businesses that had to be closed as a result. I mean, those businesses are still suffering. Um, a major economic impact generator for our region has been tourism. and. That really hasn't happened in the past year because people are, are, are not traveling. Uh, so there's implications of that that ripple through the economy, but certainly those types of businesses that support tourism activity are, are adversely affected. Um, but what we did learn, for example, with people not traveling, not going out, they tend to reinvest in their homes. So um, contractors that do home repair, maintenance, renovation work were extremely busy. Furniture stores did extremely well. Uh, we all know that grocery stores did extremely well, but at the expense of a lot of restaurants. So um, there's been a lot of disruption. As the economy continued to open up, we saw many, many types of businesses on the upswing. Um, we're still worried about those most small homegrown local businesses in our downtowns, um, worried about their survival, um, of course, uh, until a vaccine becomes widely available and, and people are more comfortable going out and doing those kinds of things. And Terry, in your report, you pointed out that um, women in the workforce were um, impacted by the pandemic. Um, it, talk a little bit about that. And while we're talking, we do want to show people your website and your Facebook page in case they want to log on and look around and, and see uh, some of these findings as well. Sure. Um, women were most adversely affected because uh, as, as a primary caregiver in, in single parent households and even in, in married households, um, women take care of the children and um, that precludes them from going back into the workforce uh, or limiting their time in the workforce. So when children are learning remotely, um, there's obviously an adult in the household watching them um children who were in daycare in that that early preschool age and toddlers uh daycares have been closed um most of 2020 um so women left the workforce to stay home and take care of the children now in a, a two-income household that caused some some financial strain um and and perhaps pushed people closer to the brink of poverty 
but in a single parent household where the woman is the, the sole provider and is now not able to work because of, the, of this barrier of, of child care, um, these individuals are, are living in poverty and, and uh, are at high risk for homelessness and, and um, food insecurity, uh, as well as poor physical and mental health and those types of things. Terry, is there a specific or a socioeconomic group that was harder hit by COVID-19 or still being impacted by COVID-19 than others? What uh, age group, socioeconomic uh, group that has been really hard hit more so than others? Um, I, I think I would relate it more to individuals that were in more retail and hospitality and tourism um, industries. And um, that, that would cover a wide variety of ages and demographics, but tend to be more younger workers. Um, uh, and maybe they're working part-time and going to school, or maybe they're working full-time uh, and are single parents. Um, but I would have to say it's more by industry in that respect um, because of the, the closures and the decreases in revenues for those that maybe had to go to a totally online format of doing business. And, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, working remotely. I mean, we even here at um, Eyewitness News, some of us have been working remotely, you know, outside of the building. Um, how has that impacted our region? And do you think that this has opened up something new, that we'll begin to see more companies uh, looking to uh, working remotely? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Well, um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, um, I, I think the who that's been most affected by remote workers are the restaurants and smaller retail locations in downtown in our downtown areas um, because they're used to the foot traffic. People in office buildings picking up sandwiches or running into a store to pick up something they need for that night or, or, or whatever the case. So without that foot traffic uh, on a daily basis, and we have some very heavily populated um, working downtowns in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. That That's a true concern and that's that's a loss that these businesses are experiencing and, and have really suffered continuous disruption, say for the past uh, 10, 11 months right now. Um, but a lot of people are working at home. Um, as, as we talk to a lot of employers, they have tentative dates for people to go back to work. Um, again, predicated on a, a widely um, available vaccine. And some businesses were hearing saying, um, yeah, I have part of my people at home and will likely continue that in the future or all of my people at home and will likely continue that in the future. I think businesses are finding that, you know, the, the future of work looks different now than it did at this time in 2020, but it could work for them. Um, and it, it saves them, you know, a variety of different expenses of having people in the workplace versus having them at home. Um, and I think for many employees, it's a very positive factor because we're hearing people say, well, you know, um, I think I'm working harder because I, I just go in the other room and my computer's there and I start working, but I'm here in my home. So I see my family more and I'm, I'm not traveling, I'm not commuting. And that makes a very big difference in, in um, promoting a, a better work-life balance and a, a better mindset. Um, and you know, some businesses uh, can have office workers work at home and have um, other people that they need doing work in, you know, manufacturing or warehousing environment and, you know, continue on a hybrid basis. So I, I think we're going to find different businesses dealing with this in a different way, but I don't think we can say going back to pre-COVID, everything will be as it was. I think, in, I think having the opportunity to work from home is a very positive thing for a number of, of folks in our community. So take, for example, we, we know that we have a lot of people that have retired recently, will continue to retire because of that whole baby boomer shift. Um, but maybe they want to work part time and maybe they're uncomfortable going out in the community or they don't have a vehicle. Well, now there's going to be work from home opportunities for them. Um, and as we enter into the next two decades of a worker shortage, 
you know, this is a good pool to choose from. Um, there's also individuals that face barriers. You know, we talked about child care as one of them, but there's there's also things like elder care um, and uh, transportation that impact certain percentages of our workforce. So these present opportunities for them to have a good paying job while working from home. So I think it's a win-win for a lot of sectors. And Terry, if I can, in, in many ways, I've heard this statement that the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the inevitable with the use of technology. You know, we always had iPhones and computers and laptops, but it was sort of an option. We could go to work. We don't have to go to work. We can use it. But so we now are so dependent on it. And maybe it, did it accelerate our society in general to use technology to a greater extent, you think? Oh, most definitely. Um, I mean, some of these tools uh, like, you know, Zoom and, and things were out there pre-pandemic. And I think they were used more as a last resort. Um, and I, I, you know, this, this whole situation has really brought them into the forefront of, of doing business. And it's also made a lot of businesses and nonprofits, and I would have to say even governments say, wow, we've not reinvested in ourselves with the appropriate types of equipment and applications and softwares, software. And, oh, we were caught off guard. We, we need to do better. Um, and so, yes, I do think it's really accelerated the use of technology. I think um, businesses are more now attuned to what they need to do. Even small businesses that, that um, were operating, you know, just relying on people coming in the door have developed Facebook pages and websites and are offering things like curbside pickup and all those kinds of things where they need this electronic or online platform to work from. Well, Terry, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about where the jobs are and some of the Institute's success stories. You're watching Newsmakers, and you can find information about our show on pahomepage.com or on the Newsmakers link. And we are the proud recipient of three Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasting Awards for Excellence in Public Affairs Programming. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Jane Ann Bugs along with Andy Mahalshik and our uh, guest today is Terry Holmes and we are talking about, she's from the Institute and we are talking about uh, the pandemic's inf um, impact on our economy and jobs. So a lot of people now um, out of work, working from home, wondering, we're getting back now, slowly getting back into the swing of things. Are there jobs out there? People are wondering, where are the jobs? Are there good paying jobs in our area? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, when we look at the job postings just in the past 30 days alone, there's nearly 7,000 jobs um, that are posted uh, for Northeastern Pennsylvania. And these jobs are in a wide variety of industries, require um, varying levels of education and skills. So an individual with a high school diploma and somebody with a professional degree has opportunity to look at jobs. Um, we're, we're seeing that um, there, there's a lot of uh, some growth going on in certain industries where the, the disruption of the pandemic has, has caused them to grow. Um, and then we're finding other businesses that are just trying to get back to pre-pandemic levels. But the one thing that, that um, we're forgetting, um, there was a little bit of a workforce shortage that was starting to manifest itself prior to the pandemic. And that's because our, um, actually nationally, we have an older population and those baby boomers started to retire about two years ago. They're still retiring and, and will plan to do so for, for the next couple decades. So you've got this large number of people leaving the workforce. And when you look at the sheer number of people following up in the ranks, you know, you're looking at this many people. And the pandemic we talked about earlier and forcing the use of technology is also gonna accelerate the use of uh, automation and artificial intelligence in, in some businesses, which is good in a way because we're still not gonna have enough bodies to fill all of these open positions from people leaving the workforce. So a lot of the job demand is, is a result of that, what we're gonna call replacement demand. And so there are opportunities in Northeastern Pennsylvania in nearly every single sector, businesses large and small, 
Um, and and we, we need to be competitive and continue to get people back into the workforce as much as we can, because this is not only a Northeast PA problem, this is a, a national problem. So we're suddenly going to be competing with other communities and regions around the country for work, workers. So the more people we could retain, the more talent we can attract, the more economically viable Northeastern Pennsylvania will become. And Terry, you were saying before uh, we had talked, uh, before we went to air about the impact, if I can backtrack just a little bit, your report showed some, the impact on school districts across the area. You're saying there's some evidence of uh, inequities in the school yes. districts for several reasons, in funding and as well as technology like broadband. Can you expound on that a little bit? Sure. Um, um the system that we have in Pennsylvania, where there are so many school districts within a county um, and they're funded um, primarily based on property tax revenues. Um, so the, the money that they have is, is relatively finite, finite and predictable based on housing values. So that means school districts in wealthier areas of our region um, uh, get higher property taxes in order to operate. So they have more money. Um, school districts in areas where the housing stock is older and doesn't have a great market value, they're working with less money. So what they can offer kids is less. So there's some of the inequities. Um, and, and, and that's a challenge because the quality of your public education really shouldn't be based on your zip code. Um, I, I think we have to do better than that. Um, the other problem is relative to broadband. Um, broadband is not equally and widely available all throughout northeastern Pennsylvania. And the, the further you get from the urban core, the less options you have and the less strength of, the, of that broadband infrastructure. So kids that are living in rural areas are having difficulties in doing remote learning. Then you add on the cost for families. And if you've got a family that's just getting food on the table and keeping a roof over their head, you're suddenly saying, OK, now you have to invest another hundred or plus dollars a month to have broadband access if it's even available. Well, that that is not always feasible in a lot of homes when people are already making choices between putting food on the table and filling a prescription. So we have some significant inequities that we need to deal with um, because they affect not only the individuals, our neighbors um, in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania, but ultimately there is a community level cost where it affects everybody. And um, Terry, we do, we're getting sure a little, a little short here on time, but I do want to talk about some of your success stories that the Institute has helped with. I know we, we talked the last time about transportation at night for nighttime workers, and we now have bus uh, lines running at night. What are some of your uh, uh, successes that you're most proud of through your indicator reports? Um, well, I, you know, there's some general ones. We, we constantly get comments from individuals who talk about how having that data has helped them develop the business plan for their organization or service delivery, or the data helped them secure a grant because they could intelligently talk about the data and draw conclusions uh, from it. So that, that's very important to us. Um, we know that we've been behind a lot of successful state legislation. Um, such as um, the, uh, the formation of land banking legislation in Pennsylvania, funding with the Housing Trust Fund. Um, we also know that uh, hospice legislation uh, with regard to opioid drugs that, that was signed by Governor Wolf nearly two years ago now um, was, was the result of a study that we did on opioid use. Um, the fact that um, both Colts and LCTA are two of our major transit systems in the two county area are talking about consolidating, consolidating is another thing that we focused on about six years ago when we talked about uh, the bus systems in the airport and the rail authority joining together to form um, a single regional transportation authority. 
And, and while there have been attempts to bring all of those together that, that haven't been quite successful, um, the two countywide bus systems are now talking about it again. And we think that's a very positive outcome because we know people live in one county and work in the other and vice versa. I mean, just stand on, on 81 on the county line at, you know, between six and eight in the morning and four and six at night, and you could see people going back and forth. It's desperately needed that we coordinate those systems and expand coverages. And we have uh, less than a minute and a half left. I want to ask you about the next indicators report. When is that coming out? And um, it's in May and it's virtual? Yes, uh, May 25th. Uh, it will be a virtual event. We're asking people to, to save the date. It will be a morning event that, that runs for about 90 minutes. And uh, we'll be getting registration information out on our website within the next two weeks. And we want to remind everyone that information from today's program and your report will be linked up to our website at pahomepage.com. We also have uh, links to your website. And if, if a group or organization out there is looking to contact you, we'll have that information on there as well. Terry, uh, we hope that the future, uh, you continue to uh, track the trends in our area and, and bring new um, ideas and help, help begin ideas in our area. And really, it uh, comes down to this, we have about 30 seconds left. Knowledge is power, Terry, that's the bottom line. Yes, that, that is. Informed decision-making is, is going to lead to very good outcomes. Well, Terry, thank we want to thank, thank you for, for joining us today. For Andy Mahalshik and everyone behind the scenes, I'm Jane Ann Bugda. Thank you for making Newsmakers part of your day, and we'll talk again next time.